By early 1943, German radar had become the silent predator of the Atlantic. Freya early warning systems and Wurzburg tracking radars dotted the coastlines of occupied France and the Low Countries, sweeping the sea for signs of Allied movement. Convoys steaming from Britain to supply the Mediterranean theater or to reinforce positions near Gibraltar faced a deadly paradox. The more ships they sent for safety, the more detectable they became. Even under radio silence, the metallic bulk of merchant vessels and escort ships returned strong echoes to radar operators watching from fortified bunkers. These returns, visible in real time, gave U-boat Wolfpack's hours of advance notice to maneuver into striking position. For Allied naval planners, radar was the unseen net that turned each voyage into a gamble. Every click of the radio, every flash of Morse, carried risk. German signals intelligence, interlinked with their radar systems, didn't need to break Allied codes to triangulate a ship's location. Direction-finding stations along the European coast could listen in, measure the angle of arrival, and quickly calculate bearings. Though Allied captains were instructed to maintain strict communications discipline, even emergency messages could betray a position. More dangerously, the enemy didn't need content, they just needed presence. The mere act of signaling could reveal a ship's existence. Allied forces experimented with low-power sets, burst transmissions, and rotating frequencies, but the problem remained, wireless signals radiate. And in a war where information often traveled faster than ships, any radiation was a liability. Among signal officers, paranoia became procedure. Warnings circulated about over-chatter, and some convoys instituted silent running periods, days when no one was to transmit at all. In this pressure cooker of surveillance and secrecy, one misstep could doom dozens of vessels. In June 1943, Convoy HX 240 departed Liverpool under heavy escort. Its mission, deliver over 50 merchant ships, along with critical aviation fuel and spare aircraft parts, to Allied bases in North Africa. For the first three days, the transit across the Atlantic remained uneventful. But as the formation neared the Bay of Biscay, German U-boat activity intensified. Allied radar detection showed faint contacts, possibly periscopes or radar shadows, but no direct engagement. Then, without warning, the convoy came under coordinated attack. Three U-boats surfaced at extreme range, launching torpedoes in a synchronized pattern. Moments later, two more attacked from a different quadrant. In just 25 minutes, a fuel tanker, a transport carrying aircraft engines, and a Liberty ship were lost. The survivors reported minimal radioactivity and near-total adherence to radar silence. Debriefings pointed to one possible cause, radar echo detection. Analysts theorized that German coastal installations had picked up the convoy while it was still days offshore. Worse, the sharp, distinct radar profile may have even revealed the convoy's size. In the aftermath, Allied planners began seeking not just radio silence, but radar distortion, a way to blur convoys into the sea. What they needed was a method to deceive, not just conceal. And it would come, not from labs or command, but from an unlikely source a single radio operator with a reputation for tinkering. Man in question was not a decorated officer or a university-trained engineer. He was a junior-grade radio operator, recently transferred from a commercial shipping background. Before the war, he had worked on merchant vessels, mostly handling long-distance communications and routine electrical maintenance. But his true passion had been amateur radio. At home, he had spent evenings constructing antenna arrays, modifying transmitters, and exchanging messages with hobbyists across the globe. None of that officially mattered to the Navy. Upon enlistment, his technical knowledge was filtered through a rigid system focused on protocol, not improvisation. Aboard the escort vessel USS Kittery, he followed orders but quietly observed flaws in naval signal architecture. He noted interference patterns, odd harmonics bouncing off rigging, and strange dead zones where signals vanished. He wasn't formally trained in wave behavior, but he had a practiced intuition. He began tinkering during off hours, adding grounding wires, adjusting antenna lengths, and rerouting signal returns through coils of wire salvaged from damaged gear. Most of his modifications went unnoticed. The few that did were dismissed as waste of time or ham radio nonsense. One officer derided a coiled copper setup as something you'd find in a junkyard. Still, 
The operator kept testing. His aim wasn't sabotage or genius. He simply wanted to see how far the limits went, how the invisible architecture of a radio signal could be bent or blurred. That curiosity would soon lead to a discovery so odd, so crude, that no one would believe it at first. During a routine Atlantic crossing, the operator had a moment of inspiration. Watching how rain distorted high-frequency transmissions, he began wondering if water and atmospheric noise could scatter radio energy, could metal do the same for radar. He cobbled together a network of spare wire, attaching one end to the base of the main mast and grounding the other near the waterline. It was not a closed circuit. It wasn't even powered. Instead, it was a passive structure, essentially a metal echo scatterer. He thought it might blur the ship's radar signature. He didn't expect much, but when another sailor spotted the modification, the mockery was instant. What's that dumb coil supposed to do? Give Jerry a headache? The operator shrugged it off. Maybe it'll bounce their ping sideways. The phrase stuck. Bounce it sideways. Even the ship's XO laughed. But he left the wires in place. There was no regulation against it, and the setup didn't interfere with comms. What began as a minor experiment, barely more than copper scrap and a few clamps, would soon reveal itself as something far more consequential. The real test came under cover of weather. Thick fog blanketed the conv as it approached a known danger zone south of Brest. Conditions favored German radar, visual spotting was impossible, and sound traveled poorly. Yet the convoy passed through unscathed. Post-mission intelligence suggested that German coastal radars had experienced irregular reflections, signals that appeared briefly but never stabilized into trackable targets. The escort ship where the operator had installed his wire trick reported no visual contacts, no radar hits from shore, and no attempted intercepts. That night, the radio operator documented everything. He recorded the coil dimensions, wire length, grounding points, and the exact placement. He made a hand-drawn schematic and included a note. Interference, diffraction, no theory, just result. When he showed it to a technician at port, the response was dismissive. You're saying your junkyard wire made us invisible? The operator didn't push. He had no credentials, only curiosity and results. Still, the data quietly circulated, first among signalmen, then among radar analysts. And though few believed it, a handful decided to replicate the setup. What they discovered next would challenge fundamental assumptions about ship visibility, radar resolution, and the invisible war playing out across the waves. To understand why the wire trick worked, we must first understand how radar sees. At its core, radar is simply directed radio energy. A transmitter emits a pulse, a short burst of high-frequency radio waves, into the surrounding air. These waves travel at the speed of light until they hit something electrically conductive, usually metal. When they strike a ship, a portion of the signal reflects back toward the source. The time delay between the pulse being sent and the echo being received tells the operator how far the target is. The strength and shape of that return help define its size and possibly even type. German coastal radar systems like Freya and Wuersberg operated in the metric wavelength range, roughly 1.2 to 2.5 meters. These frequencies were ideal for long-range detection but lacked precision. They painted broad strokes on radar scopes. A single escort could appear as a blot and a convoy as a glowing mass. While later war radars would use shorter, centimeter wavelengths for fine targeting, most U-boat and coastal radar in 1943 still relied on lower resolution. This is where interference came into play. Radar energy, like all radio waves, could scatter when it encountered irregular or complex shapes. A properly shaped aircraft could reflect radar cleanly, but add protruding wires, loops, and grounded elements, and you create a mess of signal paths. Some reflect early, some late, some cancel each other. The return signal becomes muddy, jittery, dispersed, unreliable. For German operators tracking Allied convoys at long range, this meant blips that shimmered or faded, like ghosts in the static. It wasn't about vanishing. It was about causing enough confusion that the enemy delayed action, doubted their readings, or assumed the radar was malfunctioning. In a war where minutes could determine interception windows, this hesitation was a tactical victory. 
The radio operator's wire trick unintentionally exploited these principles. His crude setup didn't absorb radar, it corrupted the signal path. Instead of a clean reflection, it returned a cloud. And that cloud, in the eyes of German radar, looked more like sea clutter than a target. Back aboard USS Kittery, the operator refined his setup. His original tangle of wire had been haphazard, assembled during downtime and never tested formally. But after the convoy passed through radar-monitored zones without incident, he started logging everything. The configuration was deceptively simple. He created a grounded loop, partially insulated and deliberately asymmetrical. One end connected near the ship's main comms mast, the other was clamped to the deck rail and grounded through the hull. The wire didn't carry signal, it was a passive radiator. Its purpose wasn't to emit, but to redirect. Electromagnetic waves from enemy radar struck the ship as usual, but upon contact with this added structure, they were split, bounced, and re-radiated along unconventional paths. The grounding altered phase alignment. The asymmetry introduced harmonic distortion. The result was a radar return that shimmered, oscillated, or fractured across the display, sometimes appearing multiple times in erratic positions. Radar analysts would later liken it to a prism distorting light, but unlike optical prisms, this one wasn't designed, it was stumbled upon. No mathematical model predicted its effect. The operator relied on instinct, shaped by years of ham radio improvisation. He didn't know about wave impedance or constructive interference in formal terms, but he had observed it across a thousand signal tweaks in civilian life. Crucially, this wasn't jamming. It didn't block enemy radar or fill it with noise. That would have required powerful, detectable emissions. Instead, the trick fooled the radar passively. It misled the eye of the machine. And in an era where radar resolution was still in its adolescence, that misdirection was often enough. One copycat crew installed the wire pattern aboard their own escort and noted similar anomalies on enemy radar logs. Another documented a German aircraft circling indecisively before breaking off. Though not universally adopted, many commanders distrusted such folk tech, the reports kept piling up. The operator's dumb idea was no longer just a curiosity, it was being taken seriously. Eventually, the reports reached the British Admiralty Signal Establishment, ASC. The ASC was responsible for radar development, countermeasures, and electronic warfare research. At first, they were skeptical. Passive alteration of radar signatures wasn't a known method. Camouflage nets, radar absorbent paint, and physical stealth techniques were being explored, but no one had considered crude wire setups as viable. Nonetheless, the reports were too consistent to ignore. The ASC replicated the operator's configuration at a coastal test range in Scotland. Using decommissioned destroyers, they mimicked the wire rig under controlled radar observation. The results surprised them. Radar return profiles changed. Signal decay increased. Target shapes distorted depending on wire length, grounding point, and orientation. In some trials, ships vanished entirely beyond 12 kilometers. Engineers began experimenting with the variables, cable gauge, loop tightness, insulation. Mathematical models were quickly developed to explain what had happened. The conclusions were clear. The operator had stumbled into a crude form of re-radiation jamming, exploiting gaps in enemy radar coherence. To confirm, they flew RAF reconnaissance aircraft with radar mapping gear over ships fitted with the wire arrays. The airborne operators reported inconsistencies. Blips blinked in and out. Some merged into sea return. Others flickered and split. It wasn't magic. It was signal distortion at scale. The most profound takeaway, it required no power, no training, and almost no cost. Any crew with salvage wire and a grounding clamp could attempt it. The implications for convoy survivability were immense. What had begun as a joke in the rain, a dumb idea, was now being drafted into technical memos circulated across the fleet. The adoption of the wire trick didn't come with ceremony. There were no official orders, no public commendations. Instead, the idea spread laterally from operator to operator, from one ship's signal crew to another's. Sailors heard rumors, swapped sketches, and tried it for themselves. Some installations were clean and methodical. 
Others were loose tangles of copper and steel clamped wherever space allowed. What mattered wasn't appearance, it was effect. Field reports accumulated. Convoys equipped with the modification noted a trend. Fewer confirmed radar detections, fewer shadowing aircraft, fewer contact reports from German sources. Shore-based intercept teams reviewing decrypted enemy logs saw growing uncertainty in radar traffic. Operators reported ghost contacts or clutter that couldn't be explained. Some even blamed atmospheric conditions. Commanders didn't trumpet these findings. Instead, they quietly encouraged crews to keep it up. The wire trick was never officially named. It didn't need to be. It became one of those battlefield adaptations born of necessity, a hack, a patch, a workaround. But in the crucible of convoy warfare, that kind of innovation often mattered more than the perfect design. It was the tactic that wasn't supposed to work, except it did. As the war progressed, the wire trick's influence outpaced its origin. Radar operators across multiple theaters began reporting the same phenomena, ambiguous returns, flickering targets, intermittent blips. Though most never knew the exact cause, signal disruption became a known factor in convict planning. Doctrine shifted subtly. New escort training included modules on shipborne radar reflection. Some commanders began issuing flexible wire kits alongside standard signal gear, unofficial, improvised, but increasingly common. On the German side, uncertainty crept in, radar logs filled with unexplained clutter. Some commanders grew wary of false positives, others delayed U-boat launches, unsure of target identity. That hesitation, just minutes in some cases, was often enough to shift engagement outcomes. In intelligence intercepts, Allied analysts noted a rise in the phrase, unconfirmed contact. The psychological impact was real. Post-war studies would document the shift in radar countermeasure philosophy. Passive disruption, once considered fringe, gained institutional legitimacy. It wasn't just about jamming with power. It was about shaping what the enemy thought they saw. And in many ways, that began with one anonymous sailor and a handful of spare wire. The operator who started it all never received a medal. He wasn't promoted. His name was footnoted in a 1954 Royal Navy technical memo and misprinted in a U.S. naval annex. By then, the war had ended and radar science had evolved. But the core idea of improvisation, of low-cost ingenuity making high-impact change, remained. In the 1970s, declassified archives at the Admiralty briefly mentioned early passive wire loop field tests. Only researchers piecing together warrior afield notes linked them back to the USS Kittery. And even then, the operator's contribution was buried under institutional reports. Yet his influence lived on. The concept of radar distortion through surface shaping would later inform stealth design. Submarines experimented with passive scatter materials. Even satellites were fitted with antenna irregularities to mask profiles. All of it, in spirit, owed something to that dumb trick. Today, radar engineers sometimes refer to the phenomenon as tuned cluttering. But among the rare few who know the story, it's remembered more simply. A sailor, a spool of wire, and a question no one else thought to ask. If you enjoy forgotten battlefield hacks, accidental inventions, and the engineering behind victory, subscribe now. There's a whole war's worth of stories they never taught you in school, and we're just getting started.